seminar partner. Today, uh, Leo will present a two-hour talk. It will be uh, divided in two parts. The first hour will talk basically about the main concepts of game theory. And in the second hour, he will talk more uh, specifically about his PhD research. Thank you. Yes, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I see some of you are still taking the pizza, so thank you for some time. I'm very happy to be uh, here and to see that there are so many of you who are apparently interested in uh, the kind of things I'm going to present today. I'm going to talk about game theory. And I have two main goals. The first one is to show you that game theory is awesome. And the second one is to uh, have you reading my research paper eventually at the end of Because I'm going to show you the ideas of that. But my real goal is to have you reading it uh, eventually. I want you to find it so interesting that you are going to be willing to get through the research paper. Okay, so the, uh, so the outline of this talk, um, so this is just the first hour, the first hour I'm just going to talk about game theory, as Timo said, uh, and I'm going to talk about what I think are the main, the most important ideas of game theory, and those which are uh, necessary to, uh, for the setting of my research. Uh, so first we talk about game theory in general uh, from a very historical perspective. Then I want to talk about dynamics and stability. And then we talk about Bayesian game theory, which uh, is really the core setting in which I'm researching. Easy. And then uh, I talk about the return functions, which is the, the key object of my research. Okay. So I start with game theory. Uh, game theory was invented by a uh, Hungarian mathematician, Hungarian ma American mathematician, who's one of the greatest mathematicians uh, of the 20th century. And for me, he's the greatest applied mathematician of all time. He, he did everything. Like he, he, he made the foundations for probability theory. He uh, made foundational work for uh, linear programming, computer science, quantum mechanics, and uh, obviously game theory. So I don't know if you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Any guess? Uh, it's not Nash. It's not Chaplet. Von Neumann. John von Neumann. He's the, the father of the computer. He is the, 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 the first man who devised how computers should work. Uh, and, uh, well, he obviously revolutionized the world. Uh, he's one of the main contributors to the Manhattan Project. Uh, and, well, he did all kind of applied mathematics. Uh, I'm not sure game theory is his, great, is his uh, greatest contribution, but it's definitely one of the most important. Uh, so John von Neumann, uh, one of the games he studied, uh, well, I think a very good example of the kind of game he was thinking about is rock, paper, scissors. Uh, so I guess everybody knows the, the rules of this game. So there's rock, paper, and scissors that you can choose. Uh, so back in the Stone Age, you cannot choose uh, papers and scissors because they haven't been invented yet, so it was a boring game. Uh, but nowadays, so you have rock, papers, and scissors. You have two players, so player I is one or two, and each player chooses one action. An action is denoted uh, with the letter A, will always be in, uh, in uh, light blue. And so crucially, the, the, the payoffs, the, the things that players are interested in, UI here, it's called the, the utility. It depends both on what player one does and what player two does. Okay, and so there's an interaction here between the actions and the uh, of the two players, and that's the key essence of game theory. There's an interaction. So you're optimizing over something that somebody else is going to be affecting. Uh, typically, uh, rock paper scissors. Uh, the set of actions here can choose from is uh, rock, paper, or scissors. And as everybody knows, uh, uh, well, so if player one plays rock and the player two plays uh, paper, paper covers rock, so paper beats rocks. So if you play your one and you've played rock and the player two has played paper, you're going to lose. You lose minus one. Uh, and conversely, if player one still plays rock and player two still plays paper, the payoff of player two is one because he paper covers rock. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. 
so it's a zero sum game. Uh, that means that if you add up the gains of the two pairs, it adds up to zero, from minus one plus one equals zero. It means that whatever one lo wins, the other loses. So it's a very specific kind of game. Uh, and as you, uh, as we'll see later, it's it's a big assumption. But it's the setting in which von o John von Neumann put uh, game theory in uh, initially. Okay. So I don't know if you, uh, there are some of you who watch Big Bang Theory, uh, but in the show they present uh, another version of this game called uh, Rock, Paper, Scissors, Lizard, Spock. Um, I'm not going to do all the, the arrows here, uh, so should, uh, if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. Uh, uh, there's an episode where uh, Sheldon uh, reads them all, what's funny. Uh, and so here you have a set of action, of action which has five elements. You can play rock, paper, scissors, spot, lizard. And every action is beats two others and is beaten by two others. And if you look at this, you can see that there's a lot of symmetries here. In fact, all the actions are, are symmetric in some sense. Uh, in some sense. So, so there's no better, no best action to, be, to play, really. And this, was, this is quite troubling. Right? Von Neumann famously said that, as far as I could see, there could be no theory of games. I thought there was nothing worth publishing. Okay? So, so you have to imagine that this is back when game theory was not invented yet. And this is the founder of game theory talking about game theory before actually inventing it. And, and it really seems that there's nothing to say because your action is, your be there's no best action, your action depends on what the other does, and what the other does depends on what you do. So there's, yeah, a priori there's nothing to say. Okay, uh, but as it turns out, uh, nowadays, uh, rock, special rock, paper, scissors has been very widely studied in the literature. I want to, so here, so here on the right is uh, 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 a website, well, it's uh, on the New York Times uh, website, there's a page on uh, rock, paper, scissors where the, we play against the computer. Uh, I've played that game against the computer and I've uh, lost like uh, 15 to 2. <laughs> so apparently uh, the, the computer is very good at reading what I'm going to do. Uh, at least I'm not a very good player. And uh, here's a, a video I want to show you. I don't know if it's going to work. Okay. So it's an, it's an extract from a, a the WC WC show. The Rock, Paper, Scissors League competes four times a week. The people in this room are fighting to go to the World Championship in Las Vegas and a chance to win $10,000. Sweetie in the lead. Doc crushes scissors for Sweetie. You're on the verge of elimination, Drew Bag. Third is final set. Winner goes on. The intriguing thing about this game is that it should be impossible to predict what your opponent's going to do next. Rock, paper, scissors are all pretty much equivalent. So each row beats one and loses to another. So essentially it's a game uh, of even odds, a bit like a flip of a coin. But if the game is entirely random, every player will be evenly matched. And yet, some people win time and time again. It is match point. Sweet James Peacock has no points here in round number two. It will be two straight throws. Can he get through round number one? No! Sweet James! So now our final match of the night. Sweet James, you're going to play Douglas. The more we play, the more we can get this one past throws. And that creates patterns that can be exploited to win the game. Sweet G came fifth in the league last year, and this season looks set to do even better. Yeah, a little 
Okay, so so what's interesting in this um, in this video? So it's an extract from a, 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 sh a show by B uh, by BBC. It's called The Code. Uh, it's on YouTube, probably illegally. So you should check it out before they put it up. And uh, what's interesting about this is that the the, the good players of uh, rock paper scissors uh, they, they talk about uh, like she talked about patterns about the fact that we didn't play randomly. There's no random way of uh, people don't manage to play randomly and it seems that she's saying that in fact we should play randomly and it seems hard to play randomly and this is the key idea of John von Neumann actually the idea that we should we actually play randomly the idea of probability so the idea of probabilities so a strategy um, okay, so a strategy according to John von Neumann is a is a probability distribution on, on action. It's a way of playing randomly the actions. It's a probability distribution. So, for instance, you can play two thirds of the time rock, uh, a sixth of the time uh, paper, and another sixth of the time scissors. And the, the the reason why this definition is very important in game theory is that this strategy can be considered public. So, if you play rock people rock paper scissors time and time again. Eventually, people will know what your strategy is because they, they can just see how you play and deduce from that the strategy, the, the way you choose your actions. So the actions themselves are not public information. You, you cannot know what the, the action of the other is, but you can know what the, the strategy of the other is. And that, that, that word here, public, is really what makes what really makes you know, the reason why we can say something about game theory. And so the reason why uh, John Von Neumann, John Von Neumann was able to come up with a theory of games. Okay. Because now, once you have this, uh, now that you know that strategies are actually public, then you know that player one will f solve this optimization problem. He will have to choose his strategy knowing that it will be public, that play player two will be playing with the knowledge of player one's strategy. Okay. Now, player two is going to want to maximize his utility, so he, he's going to want to maximize U2. But because we are in a zero-sum game setting, maximizing U2 is equivalent to minimizing U1. Okay. So that's why the prime of player one, he knows that player two is going to minimize his utility, and he wants to maximize the, the fact that uh, his utility knowing that player two is going to minimize it. Okay. That's why it's a max min problem. Okay. Everybody is fine with that? Okay. Uh, now, converse, conversely, uh, player two is the opposite. Uh, so, his strategy, he knows that it's going to be public, so when he chooses it, he offers it to the, as a public information. And then he knows that player one is going to react to that and play the best strategy against that. Okay. So you can think of, of this as, uh, uh, if you're doing uh, optimization as a robust program, uh, a, a robust optimization program where you're playing against uh, nature. So nature is going to choose what's worse for you and you have to make the best of what's worse, of the worst case. Now, a period, these two are very different. A period, uh, there are two very different problems. But if you're familiar with linear programming, you can notice that U1 actually is linear in S1 and is linear in S2. So it's a, a bilinear function. And it's a max min of a bilinear function. And here you have the opposite, it's the min max. Uh, so if you're familiar with uh, optimization, it's the, dual, it's the duality. Here is the, the dual, if you think of that as a Lagrangian. These two are dual programs. And because it's a linear setting, but by strong duality, these two have the same value. But John Von Neumann didn't know that. He invented linear program afterwards. <laughs> so he actually used another argument. He used a fixed point theorem. Uh, but anyways, uh, here's the theorem. So it's called the minimax theorem. 
He says that the two programs we saw, we saw earlier have the same value. Okay? And there's an optimal strategy for each player. And they, they kind of go together perfectly. Okay? So if you take rock, paper, scissors, uh, these optimal strategies for each player uh, is uh, the uniform distribution over all the items. It's one third paper, one third rock, one third scissors. And if you do that, you're maximizing the worst case. You know that whatever the other does, you will get a gain of zero. And the other, yeah, because you get it symmetric, the, the optimal strategy for the other is the same. Okay, but that was it's very specific to zero sum games. So zero sum games are very specific. First of all, there are only two player games. Uh, but we want to extend that to, to, to more general settings. Uh, well, it's not that obvious because it took, it took quite a while for people to think that this is actually not the most general kind of games. And it took another genius of mathematics to, to think about other games. Uh, I guess you know who he is, John Paulus Nash. Uh, so if you haven't seen the, the movie uh, Beautiful Nine about uh, Nash's life, uh, I suggest you, you check it out. Uh, so John Nash is here. Here is uh, probably someone that nearly as good. <laughs> He's my professor. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, so, so here's the setting of, of John Nash. In, uh, in John Nash setting, there's many more players. You have a set N of players. Uh, and once again, each player can choose an action. Uh, we can group all these actions together as a, a vector. So this is called an action profile. So it's just putting all the actions of all the players together. And then you have the payoff, the gain of each player, which depends on the action profile. Okay? Now there's no assumption of zero-sum games. It, it can be anything. But crucially, once again, the utility of one player depends on whatever the others do. The actions of others are involved in, in the... In, in the the utility of, of, of player i. And once again, it, it, it makes little sense in, in many cases to talk about actions. The key concept, once again, is to think in terms of strategies, because strategies are public information as opposed to uh, actions. Mm -hmm. So the key concept uh, here is uh, really uh, John Ash has made uh, uh, many other contributions to, to mathematics, and a lot of people think that the Nash theorem is not his most important co contribution. But I think this actually is because it's a real conceptual leap. It's, it's, it's not that complicated. It says that the Nash theorem is a strategy profile, so everyone has a public strategy, and it's an equilibrium. This public strategy, this strategy profile here. Is an equilibrium if no one has incentive to deviate from his present strategy. In other words, if everybody else is playing according to the strategy profile, then say player I here, his best action, his best strategy, is to play the strategy SI of the strategy profile. Okay? So assuming that all the players but what I call X minus I, this is the uh, strategies of all the others except player I, then the best strategy for player I, the one that maximizes his utility, is precisely SI, the, the one of the strategy profile. Okay. Okay. And it's an equilibrium concept, which means that once players play a Nash equilibrium, then everybody is going to want to stay in this equilibrium. No one will want to move away, and so it's, it's really a, an equilibrium concept. Once we're in here, there's no reason why we should move away from a Nash equilibrium. Okay. And, be, and everything is public, so everybody knows what's going on, and everybody is fine with the Nash equilibrium, so everything will stay the same. Okay. Any question about the uh, Nash equilibrium? Okay. So th this is a very important concept of, of game theory. Okay, so, so there are two important theorems that Nash uh, proved. Well, I don't know if you proved the first one, but 
The first one is say, it says that the optimal strategies of zero sum games we talked about earlier in the John von Neumann setting are Nash equilibrium. It's not that obvious. Huh? I mean, in the first case, what pairs were really doing is maximizing the worst case. This appears has little to do with some sort of equilibrium state. But this theorem says that actually it's an equilibrium state. And the second theorem is a theorem by uh, Donash, uh, 1951, probably the, the most famous theorem in, in game theory. One of the most famous theorems is in, uh, in mathematics, in recent mathematics. Uh, it says that every finite game, so by finite I mean that the set of actions is finite, like in rock, paper, scissors, there were three actions. If the set of actions is finite, then uh, every finite game has a, a Nash equilibrium. It's a, it's a very influential theorem. A lot of people quote that. But when John von Neumann learned about that, when, when John Nash told von Neumann that, hey, I've just proved that, von Neumann said that, that's trivial. That's just a fixed point theorem. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I don't think that this theorem is that important, but the concept of Nash equilibrium is much more important than this theorem. Uh, so if you want to know more about uh, game theory in general and Nash equilibrium, uh, so uh, I write on, uh, on Science for All, scienceforall.org, uh, and there's all, there are all these two uh, articles on, uh, yeah. Oui, l'équilibre de Nash, est-ce que c'est nécessairement le point où que tous les joueurs ensemble ont le maximum euh, de gains? Non. Okay. C'est comme un, un optimum local, parce que tout le monde est ici. C'est plus faible qu'un optimum local. Enfin, c'est un, un autre... Uh, so, so, uh, yeah, I should do it in English. So basically, you have... It's as if you have one direction for each player, Okay? And along each direction, at a Nash equilibrium, it's, an, an optimum, it's a maximum for the utility of that player. Okay? So, so, there are, so, so one thing that's, that may be complicated is that there are one utility function for each player, so there is no concept of optimality for all players. You have to look at each player individually, and for each player at a Nash equilibrium, it's the maximum. Okay, other questions? Okay. So, so the first article here uh, gives you many examples of, of games, of very classical games. Uh, the second uh, article here give uh, an overview of, uh, of more modern and recent uh, game theory research. Now, there's one big question that I want to raise, and it's going to be a very, very important question uh, for, for, for all the things I'm going to talk about later. Uh, is, the, is the question, the very simple question, do players actually play a Nash equilibrium? Because in mathematics it's a very beautiful concept, and I'm very happy to work with it. But sometimes it's, it's I mean, it's applied to economics, uh, it's interesting to ask the question, do players actually play Nash equilibrium? It takes a quite a lot of effort to be maximizing a function, especially over strategies and the function may be complicated. So it's not that obvious that players will actually play Nash equilibrium. But the first thing you might want to ask is, are players rational? Are they going to really maximize, do, do some sort of maximization? And the second problem is that even if they were rational, would they still play the Nash equilibrium? Because the commuting Nash equilibrium problem, which is a, uh, you can see that as a problem in complexity theory, uh, is known to be PPAD complete, uh, which basically means very hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not NP complete, but almost. Uh, and a lot of people think that PP, well, well the main idea uh, consensus in the, the, the main intuition in the community is that PPID complete problems are not polynomial. They cannot be computed in a reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. So, as Kamal Jain, a uh, researcher at eBay, we put it, if your laptop cannot find it, how can a market find it? Because basically, whatever a market can, can do could be computed by a, a laptop, a pure. So if you have a concept that computers cannot find, how can players out there find it? It's, it's, well, basically, it's not possible. 
So this way is the question, of what's the point of an Nash equilibrium if it's something that's not, we cannot observe, that it's not out there. And this leads me to uh, the second point, dynamics and stability. Okay. So, so let's start with rational players. Uh, so if you have rational players, uh, given the strategies of all the others, you may, they are going to, to maximize their utility given the, the, utilities, uh, the strategies of the other players. Okay. So if you know what the other players, and you're very intelligent, you can figure out what your best strategy is. So this is called the best reply of the, the set of best replies of player i to the strategy s minus i of the others. Okay, and you can define a, a strategy profile, a best reply strategy profile, uh, by saying that if everybody was playing s previously, the best reply to that is each player best replying to s minus i. Okay, so for all player i, you take the best reply to S minus I. Okay, so each here is the set of best reply for player I. And if you take all them together, this gives you the, the best reply strategy profile. Okay, any question? Okay, and a Nash equilibrium can be seen as just a, a fixed point, as Van Neumann would say. It's just a fixed point of uh, this best reply class Okay. So strategy profile, which is the best reply to itself. Okay, so let's take rock, paper, scissors. Um, so you can see that there's a line here, remember like that? Um, so in rock, paper, scissors, you can represent the set of strategies by a, a, a triangle. Uh, so here is playing rock, here is playing paper, here is playing scissors. And if you're here, basically you're playing a lot of of scissors and a bit of, of the two others. Uh, if you're here, you're playing uh, uh, rock and uh, scissors, but not paper. Okay. So this is the, the simplex. Uh, present the set of probabilities and options. And given where your opponent is, so if your opponent is here, for instance, that means that he plays a lot of rocks, then your best reply to that would be playing paper. Okay. So if your opponent is here, you should play that. Okay. Uh, so if you play, so imagine you're playing that, uh, your opponent is playing that, and you're playing that. Uh, so your opponent played that, so you you would play that. And since you were here, your opponent would uh, would play rock. Well. Okay. And, and and now you you best be playing to that. So since your opponent, so you are here. See, if you are here, your opponent is going to best reply to that. It means playing uh, scissors, so he's moving here. And your opponent was here, so you're best replying to him. So you use, you're playing paper here. <laughs> this is the next stage. It can go on, but... <laughs> uh, well, one simplification we can do is, because it's a symmetric game, you can assume that players are... Well, it's natural to assume that players are symmetric, so they're playing the same strategies. So basically, if the two players are playing rock, then when they are both best replying, they both play paper. Okay, and when you paper, you bring here, and then, uh, wow, well, it's easier for me to do. Uh, so basically, you're always traveling like that, uh, which is not uh, very interesting. <laughs> it's just dumping all around, yeah. So that's the best reply dynamics. So if everybody is always re best replying to what the other does, it's the kind of dynamics we would have. Okay. And there's no convergence for average jump, jumping. One way of stabilizing that is to average all the actions that have been played in the past. So this is known as fictitious play. You, you're not best to spread, you, like you're not really looking at uh, where the, the opponent work uh, is at time uh, at a certain stage, but you look at all the steps he were at in the previous steps, and you average out. Okay. And by doing this, you get a, a convergence. But I would claim it's not a real convergence. You're never really playing the strategies. You're always moving in triangles. So you never really, it's not a random distribution, it's a triangle every time. 
Okay? And it's basically the same way that the sum of minus 1 to the n. I don't know if you've seen this video, it's on, it's on all over YouTube. You have things like that. If you do 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1, a lot of people claim, claim that it's equal to 1 half because you're always moving from 1 and in average you're going to 1 half. Okay? So it, it's possible to give sense to that and it's possible to give sense to that. But it's not actually what happens. Okay? So there's not really a convergence. And one way of seeing that is through this diagram here. Uh, so here, imagine you uh, one way of understanding that is that you're in a, a huge population of people and you're going to play randomly against one of, of, of the guys there. And in this population, there's a fraction of them that play rock, a fraction that play paper, and a fraction that play scissors. Okay, you don't know really the proportions, uh, but if you, well, eventually you know the proportions, so you know where the population as a whole is where is. So if the population is here, you know that your best strategy is to play uh, paper. Right? So you're going to, to move towards paper. It may take time because for the population to move as a whole, each needs to learn about what the, the optimal is. So it takes, it takes more time for some people to learn. But the idea here is that you're always moving towards the best reply strategy. Okay, so the, you're moving towards the best reply strategy. You, you, you're here and you're moving towards that. So if you're here, you're moving towards that. But if you write it uh, formally, it doesn't go that way, it goes that way. Okay, and, wh and what you see here is that if you start here, if the population as a whole is here, then the diamond dynamics will be turning around here and will be cyclic. There's no convergence. So here, in rock, paper, scissors, the, the central point, the, 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 the Nash equilibrium, the, the, the optimal strategy of, of one setting, setting, is not actually something that's actually going to be observed. And, it's why, and I think it's why rock, paper, scissors is so interesting. is because people don't actually play that. Even in rational people would not be playing that. Because depending on the situation of, of others, there are trajectories in, in this space which don't go here. Yeah? Yeah, but if, say, there is some statistical analysis about situations, which look at the behavior of players at this game, would the distribution of the strategy played by this player would be part of the third third third? But it, <laughs> I'm not sure I understand, but if you stop here, you're going to stay here. No, no, I mean, if, say, okay, if you are in a, you look at the, the population yeah. and you look how they play, okay, um, uh, maybe there is a distribution of uh, strategy among that population, a sufficiently large population, and maybe one third, one third, one third. And then you can if you are equilibrium, means then optimal. Yeah, if you are at the, the equilibrium, you stay at the equilibrium. The, the equilibrium. Mm -hmm. That's the Nash equilibrium. But if you're not at the equilibrium, you don't get there. Mm -hmm. you, you turn around it, but you never get there. That, that's the, the key message of this graph. Um, now, this graph has a, I don't know if it has inspired, but, uh, uh, um, uh, well, Let's just give the names of the two researchers who came up with a new way of understanding, of, of looking at game theory. Well, it's rather a new way of, of looking at biology. Uh, it has then, uh, and it uses, it involves game theory. Uh, so these are two biologists, mathematicians, I don't know how to say it, uh, George Press and John Maynard Smith. And they came up with a Darwinian approach of what game theory could be. So. The idea is that you still imagine a population. Like there are a lot of, of, uh, of players, and they can be chicken, uh, fox, or snakes. Okay? So I don't know, it's, it's a French game called, it's called uh, I don't know how you, if it's popular in other countries, it's called uh, Pour un Armipère. 
so basically, uh, fox feeds on uh, on the chicken. Snakes feed on, on fox. I don't know if it's very likely. But, and uh, snakes uh, feed on uh, uh, sorry, chicken feeds on uh, on snake. So if there's a lot of snake here, for instance, then there's a lot of food for uh, for chickens. And also, uh, these guys are going to be eaten a lot. So the population of these guys is going to decrease, and the population of these guys um, is going to increase. Okay. And it's just in the Darwinian of natural selection uh, way. Okay. So mathematically, one way of formalizing that is that uh, there's some sort of the, the utility of a strategy is a sort of fitness. It's called fitness, right? It's what biology is called fitness. Okay. And so the greater your, your, your utility when you play against the population, the greater your utility is, the more you develop, the more your strategy will develop. And, gives, and this gives a, a dynamics. It's called the replicator dynamics. Okay. And interestingly, what, once again, what, what you see here is that the Nash equilibrium, you never get there. You always circle around the Nash equilibrium. So, so once again, the Nash equilibrium here, does it make sense to talk about this natural equilibrium? You never get there. Okay. Now, you can modify the game to see some interesting behavior. So, um, we had a zero-sum game. So, our paper sees as a zero-sum game. But we can think of games which are not zero-sum. After all, in nature, it's possible that two populations both grow simultaneously. You don't have to one increase and the other increase. And if you consider that, then if you have a big win for, for the predator, uh, so if you win a lot by eating someone else, uh, then the, 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 the Nash equilibrium becomes stable. Other trajectories actually get to the Nash equilibrium. And that's true with the best reply, uh, with the well, continuous best reply dynamics and with the replicator dynamics. Uh, and conversely, if you have a, a big loss for the prey, so once you return, uh, maybe all your relatives kill themselves because you're dead, <laughs> something like that, uh, then the equilibrium becomes unstable. If you start close to that, you're going to move away from this equilibrium. Eventually, there's going to be only one person standing, one, uh, one strategy standing. Okay? And, and that's very interesting because it, the, the poverty of being stable or unstable doesn't depend on the dynamics you're choosing. It doesn't depend if you're considering best reply dynamics or replicator dynamics or some four other dynamics I don't remember. And it seems to, so, so it seems to be very an important concept, the concept of stability of a Nash equilibrium. Okay? So if you want to know more on evolution game theory, once again, there's a, a Nash equilibrium sense for all this. Okay. Ah, so time is flying. Now I want to talk about Bayesian game theory because that's much more what I do, and I think it's very important. And this is, a, I think, a something that is going to grow, be growing in the next years. Uh, so Bayesian game theory. So here I have uh, Thomas Bayes. Uh, he's never done game theory. Uh, he was he lived in the 6th, 17th century, but he's the, the considered as the, the father of probability theory. And as you see, Bayesian game theory is a lot about introducing a lot of probabilities into these games more than there already is. Uh, and the other is really the founder of Bayesian game theory. Uh, he's called uh, John Harson. So I don't know if you noticed it, but he's the fourth John I've talked about. Mm -hmm. like four people like, out, of, out, out of five <laughs> call it John. So I'm thinking about sending my first name to become more popular in this field. Okay. So the idea of Bayesian game theory is that there is uncertainty about the payoffs U i of A. Okay? So in the Nash setting, U i of A was public information sometimes. So everybody knew what the payoff of a person would be given a strategy, uh, an action profile. But does it make sense to, to, to make this assumption? In fact, there are many examples uh, where, where this is not true. If you know all the, the actions of, of the players, you, you don't know how happy the people will be. Uh, so here are some examples. If you consider shift scheduling, that's what I'm working on. Uh, if you consider shift scheduling, 
uh, where people are asking for something like they, they're giving their preferences and they, they expect some 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 good shifts some shifts that correspond to their to their demands if you know what everybody has asked for there's no way of for you to say if you're going to be happy with that because what you're interested in is not what the, the, the other players are doing but it's the shift that's going to be given to you so the actions are sort of given, but they, they still interact in some way, and there's some outcome that comes out, and that's what you're interested in, not the action profile. Okay. Another example is poker. In poker, you have uncertainty because you, okay, so the actions in play are whether to fold or raise or, or call, uh, but even if you know all the actions, you still don't know if you're going to win money because it depends on the cards that people have. If it goes all the, to, to if if it goes to people showing the, the, the hands, so it depends on some information that's not here, that that's not accessible to you. Okay, another example uh, is what well, parents. If you want to make teams of two, well, you don't know how people will feel about being in your team. <laughs> okay. So the, the information, there are many information that can be incomplete. Uh, there can be incomplete information about the outcomes. So that's the case of shift scaling, for instance. And there's also an uncertainty about how people feel about the outcomes. How people feel about being with you. Okay. Okay, so I want to ask a question. Is it worth studying version game theory? Actually, it's, it's much more complicated, as you'll see. It involves much more, much more variables. It's, it's more complicated. And my short answer to that is yes, yes, no, <laughs> yes, no, <laughs> yes. Come on. Okay, so let me give you a, a, the classical convincing answer. Why the answer is yes, and it's because in many cases in, in real life there is incomplete information. It's natural assumption because it fits the world around us. The world around us is filled with incomplete information. So it, it may sound a bit weird to, to make always the assumption that there's not incomplete information. Um, but that's not the most convincing answer to me because if you look at, uh, at a lot of models in economics, a lot of models in economics may make a lot of assumptions. A lot of assumptions. I'm sorry for the economists in the room. <laughs> they do make a lot of assumptions, but sometimes the models are still very relevant. And that's because a model is not necessarily, especially in, in game theory, the models are not here to describe very, in very detailed, in a very detailed manner the reality. They're, re they're here rather to show what kind of patterns, what kind of things of a phenomenon can emerge out of a model, out of a, a few assumptions. What kind of things we can expect, how we can explain that such things arise. And my key message I would say about game relation game theory is that it's very important because it unveils some patterns that would be that would be impossible to explain without the assumption of incomplete information. So it's a lot of work, but it's worth it. That's sort of the message. And uh, so, incomplete information gives lots of new uh, features to game. And an example of that is I claim, although it's maybe intuitive, I haven't proved it, that uh, incomplete information creates a lot of stability to Nash equilibrium. So, so that's an intuitive claim. But it's very important to me because stability are the reason why. Nash equilibrium, the, the concept of Nash equilibrium fits the reality. So if you don't have stability, it's pointless for me, as far as I know, to, to talk about Nash equilibrium. It's, fine. it's nice mathematically, but to describe the reality, it's pointless. But if you do have stability, then this makes Nash equilibrium very relevant to analysis, to analysis of the world. And that's why, for me, inform incomplete information is so important, because it's a source of stability and it, it makes the concept of Nash equilibrium all the more relevant. Okay, so if you want to learn more about Bayesian game, uh, an article on Sensor, uh, it takes uh, uh, examples from uh, card games mainly. 
and uh, show you how you work out the, the basic ideas of, of, uh, of Bayesian game. Okay, now there's actually one specific k k kind of Bayesian games that I like to study. It's called one-stage Bayesian games. The one-stage Bayesian game uh, players only act once and simultaneously. Uh, so the, the the straightforward counterexample of that is poker. In poker, you don't players play sequentially, even though there's incomplete information. Players play sequentially. So in rock, paper, scissors, also it's a one stage game. You just play once and that's it. Okay. So that's the, the, those are the games I'm really interested in. And you might want to ask, isn't it too restrictive? It's only a class of game. Okay. Okay, so I have many answers to that. <laughs> The first one is that every game can conceptually be reduced to a one-stage game. Okay? So for example, if you take poker, a, a strategy in poker can be, uh, or rather an action in poker, can be regarded as a way to react to all the information you have. Okay? So you choose to call given all the information of the game that has been given to you earlier. And if you consider an action, let's call it, I don't know, let's go, maybe there's a problem of terminology here. When I talk about an action in, in, in poker, usually it's rather whether you're going to fold, call, or raise. Uh, so let me call super action the fact that you're taking this decision with the knowledge of the information that's given you in the game. Okay? So a super action in poker is a way of saying, well, whatever position in the game you're giving me, I'm going to make a decision. It's a formula, it's a function that maps information to actions. And that I call a super action. Okay? And if you consider the super actions of this game, you can reduce your game to a one-stage game. People just choose super actions. Hence a one-stage game. Okay? So that's a, a conceptual way to reduce uh, every version games to one stage game, but it's stupid computationally okay? because the st set of uh, actions is uh, exponential after that, and uh, it's not tractable. So it, computationally, it's stupid, but conceptually, it, it makes sense. Okay. Uh, now, the, the the more important reason why I focus on one stage game is because I work also in, in mechanism design. Uh, where we try to define the way people are going to interact. So we choosing the rules of a game in an optimal way. Okay. And there's a famous, uh, famous principle called the regression principle that says that whatever game you're considering, whatever mechanism you're considering, you can always bring it back, reduce it to uh, a one-stage by using game. And that's the real motivation. And finally, uh, the third bullet it says that uh, what I'm going to present here can be extended in a, in a rather interesting way to multi-stage schemes. But I haven't done that. Uh, I haven't done that yet. Okay, so here's the model. So you have a set of outcomes. So think of, uh, of shift scheduling to be free. Uh, in shift scheduling, you have a set of action uh, of outcomes, uh, which can be sheets, few or uh, allocations, uh, few cutting a cake as we'll be doing later, or prices, or well, all, all the, 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 the relevant information that people are really interested in. People are not really interested in what the others do. They're really interested in, in, the, in the outcome of the game, in some allocation that, are, that is going to be given to them. So I call X the set of uh, outcomes. Um, a mechanism is a way of mapping action profiles to outcome. So typically, a shift scheduling me uh, mechanism takes into account whatever the people say and outputs the shift, the allocations, the outcome. Okay. Okay. And also, in, so this is really the Bayesian game theory part of the, the hypothesis. There's a private information, which I call theta i, here on the preferences, uh, the private information is about the preferences, the preferences of player I. And we assume here that only player I knows what he wants. Okay. So it's called type, 
of uh, call it type. A type is only known by player I and specifically what he wants. And only he knows what he wants. He may not want this information to go public. It can remain private. And now the, the, the UI of A, uh, which I've been using earlier, is now stochastic. Now we don't, uh, other players cannot know it because it depends on the theta i. It also depends on the outcome of the allocation uh, uh, of the mechanism. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. So here, this equation is, I, I, I think, is the the real thing that triggered all the other reasonings that I had. Just to write utilities down that way. It's not that often done classically because of the Nash modeling of games. Okay, and also to make the games uh, uh, Bayesian, I need to introduce some probability, which I call belief. So other players don't know the theta i of player i, but they have some belief uh, of what it can be. And this belief is described by a probability distribution. So you don't really know what the others are, but you know that there's a certain party that kind of wants that, kind of wants that, another party that he wants something else, and so on. Okay. Uh, now, in this setting, a strategy is a way of reacting to the information you have. Yes. Okay. <coughs> the theorem of the power on the max. Here, encore, with the duality, with the new. No. Uh, so the minimax theorem only holds with complete information, two players, zero sum games. Okay. So it's very <laughs> not general. Okay. But it was the beginning of game theory, so it's important. Okay. So a strategy uh, in this setting, a strategy uh, is a way of reacting to private information. And as opposed to actions, we assume that this can be done stochastically. Okay. Think of, uh, so stochastically, think of bluffing. In poker, the optimal strategy could be to bluff with a certain probability. So that's why there's some stochastic CD here. <coughs> and then there's the concept of Bayesian Nash equilibrium. Uh, so Bayesian Nash equilibrium uh, was well, just like before, you know the strategies of the others and you're reacting to this. And if this your, your best reply strategy corresponds to the strategy profile, then it's an Nash equilibrium. Any question? Okay. Uh, so similarly, you can define also the, the best reply. So SI is the best reply to S minus I if he maximizes his utility. Okay, so this is just the long way of writing just the fact that others are playing strategy S minus I. And there's uh, and you have to use the expectation because you don't know what the, the, the preferences is. Oh. Okay. But essentially, it's just you choose your best strategy, best super strategy to the strategies of the others. Okay. And this best, so, so this best reply depends on the belief, theta i, which is here, theta t, and on the mechanism m. Okay. Okay, so, so this is a map of the variables. Uh, you have the, the type of all the players, the players have the, each of the type. They are private information, only uh, they know it. Uh, using their strategies, they choose actions. And these are actions are input into the games, the game, uh, into a mechanism which spit out uh, an, uh, an outcome. So people here are choosing their strategy so as to have the best outcome. And then everybody can judge his utility given this outcome. But once again, the utility of player i is only known by player i. Okay, so to make it more accurate, I should have put parities everywhere, but it works, it's just. Okay, so here's the, the return of the big question. Uh, do people really play Bayesian Nash equilibrium? Uh, because Bayesian Nash equilibrium are Way more complicated than Nash Rekuria. Uh, so Bayesian game theory is much more complex than game theory. 
if you found it hard to compute the Nash equilibrium before, it's going to be even harder to, put, to compute a Bayesian Nash equilibrium. So you have to have players which are even more rational, in some sense, who are at least a Darwinian selection that is even more accurate. But it's not obvious to talk about Darwinian of uh, uh, replicator dynamics in this setting. It's, it's actually very hard. Uh, private information remains private. Private. Okay, uh, and that's a big trouble. At the end of the game of a, Nash of a classical game, you knew everything about the game. You knew all the strategies, everything. Here, you don't know the, the, the types, or the private information, so you cannot figure out, based on the history of the game, what are the strategies of the others. Strategies are actually no longer public information. And that's a big trouble, because the key point I was making about the Nash equilibrium is that it was an equilibrium because people knew the strategies of the others, because strategies were public information. But now, info, uh, strategies are private information. And this is a, a very important point. So as I said, computing a version Nash equilibrium seems much harder, and there's hardly any theory of stability. So I think I, I'm going to end this first hour with this slide, because this slide is, I think, uh, the, the punchline of, of, this, uh, of this talk. If I, I were not a, game, a Bayesian game theorist, and I wanted to criticize game, Bayesian game theory, I would just put this slide and wait for an answer. I'm saying, what you guys are doing is pointless, because Bayesian Nash equilibrium makes no sense. They're not computable and they're based on, in, on public information which are actually private. Okay, okay so, um, okay, so I'm skipping that, and uh, just, or maybe I just put this slide, uh, to tell you that in the next hour we'll talk about the return functions, and we'll see that the return functions perfectly replace strategy, they are observable and tractable, and so they perfectly fit the concept of Bayesian Nash equilibrium, and they are nice historical.